welcome to our 80th mnemonic in internal medicine. This is Ryan here. Hope you are well. This is a place to record my sincere thanks and appreciation to everybody who's been liking and sharing and subscribing to my channel. I pray God bless you and thank you for all your support. So today I thought we could talk about the steroid pathway. Quite a topical one, this. And um, first I hope you uh, let me favor you with a few uh, uh, dad jokes about steroids. So, what do you call a flower on steroids? You call it a power plant. <laughs> and my friend admitted to steroid use. You know, it takes quite a big man to do that. <laughs> okay. Alright. So, guys, just uh, allow me to encourage you with a few scriptures. You know that we should never ever be anxious or afraid about anything in life. Uh, the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 29 through 31, Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Right? Imagine God, the creator of the heaven and earth, cares to know you so much that he knows the very number of hairs on your head. You are loved and you are protected. Always remember that. Okay, so guys, let's talk about the steroid pathway. I know it looks a bit scary, but uh, we're going to break it down piece by piece. Now, knowing the steroid pathway is critical, not just in the context of endocrinology and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, but also has applications whenever we prescribe steroids in medicine. And you know, there are many scenarios when we use steroids in medicine, for instance, in rheumatological conditions, in COPD exacerbation as part of chemotherapeutic regimens, just to mention a few. Now, in terms of the endogenous uh, steroid synthesis. Let's talk a bit about the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are also known as the suprarenal glands and are small triangular shaped glands located on top of both kidneys. Now they are comprised of two parts, the cortex on the outside and the medulla on the inside. And the cortex is divided histologically and functionally into three separate zones which are mentioned here. Now we can remember these zones by the mnemonic GFR, not glomerular filtration rate, but zona glomerulosa, the G, the F is for fasciculata and the R for reticularis. And the way to remember the function of each of these different histological zones is to remember that the deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. So you start off with salt in the glomerulosa, which then progresses downwards to sugar, in the in fasciculata and then lastly to sex in reticularis, right? So, of course, in saying this, what we are saying is that the zona glomerulosa is associated with aldosterone, which brings in salt. So we know aldosterone, the primary function is to upregulate the epithelial sodium channels in the distal tubule, which eventually is to bring in sodium and dump potassium, all right? Um, the zona fasciculata is associated with cortisol, which is associated with sugar, and zona reticularis with sex steroids, all right? Okay, so um, if we start off with the zona glomerulosa, we have a variety of substrates uh, which are enzymatically converted from one to the next, okay? So we start off with cholesterol and we have this beautiful enzyme called desmolase, which converts cholesterol into pregnenolone. And then we have pregnenolone becoming progesterone and we have the enzyme 21 alpha hydroxylase, which catalyzes the conversion of progesterone to deoxycorticosterone. And then 11 beta hydroxylase converts deoxycorticosterone down to corticosterone, which then becomes 18 hydrocorticosterone and thence to aldosterone. Right In the zona fasciculata, which is concerned with cortisol, we have pregnenolone, which becomes 17 hydropregnenolone via the action of 17 alpha hydroxylase, and progesterone becomes 17 hydroprogesterone also via the action of 17 alpha hydroxylase. Thereafter, 17 hydroprogesterone becomes 11 deoxycortisol and dense cortisol via the actions of 21 alpha hydroxylase and 11 beta hydroxylase uh, specifically. Now, I want to pay special attention to 21 alpha hydroxylase because we're going to draw on a clinical correlate on this later on, all right? And then 17 hydroprogesterone becomes dehydroepiandrosterone. 17 hydroprogesterone becomes androstenedione, right? And then... Um, what happens is we have this enzyme called aromatase, which is located peripherally, not in the adrenal gland. And the function of aromatase is to peripherally so-called aromatize or convert androstenedione to testosterone, right? Um, I beg your pardon, androstenedione to estrone and testosterone down to estradiol, all right? That's the function of aromatase. All right. 
All right. So, you know, I mentioned that we must pay specific attention to this beautiful enzyme uh, 21 alpha hydroxylase. That's because I want to talk about a condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Right now, the classic form of 21 uh, hydroxylase deficiency is the most common cause of, uh, you know, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. It has an incidence of between 1 in 10,000 and 1 in 15,000, and it's the most common cause of androgenization in chromosomal 46XX females. Now, affected individuals are homozygous or compound heterozygous for severe mutations in this enzyme 21 uh, alpha hydroxylase. This mutation essentially causes a block in uh, adrenal glucocorticoid and mononucleotide synthesis, increasing 17 hydroprogesterone levels and shunting steroid precursors into the androgen synthesis pathway. So you can see whenever you have 21 alpha hydroxylase, we have a block at that point, and that's going to shunt your precursors down towards the synthesis of your sex steroids. So glucocorticoid insufficiency causes a compensatory elevation of uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone, resulting in adrenal hyperplasia and additional synthesis of steroid precursors proximal to the level of the enzymatic block. Increased androgen synthesis in utero causes androgenization of the 46XX fetus in the first trimester. The result is ambiguous genitalia seen at birth, with varying degrees of clitoral enlargement and labial fusion. The salt-wasting form of 21-alpha-hydroxylase deficiency results from severe combined glucocorticoid and mononucleotide deficiency. A salt-wasting crisis usually manifests between 5 and 21 days of life and is a potentially life-threatening event that requires urgent fluid resuscitation and steroid treatment. All right. Thus, we should always entertain a diagnosis of 21-alpha-hydroxylase deficiency uh, in any baby with atypical genitalia with bilateral non palpable gonads. All right. And this condition, albeit not very common, is something of an example that we can draw on when there is a block in the steroid pathway. All right, guys. So just remember, steroid synthesis, adrenal gland focusing on the adrenal cortex is divided histologically into three zones. GFR, zona glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. And the deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. Salt, sugar, sex, speaking to aldo, cortisol, and hence sex steroids. God bless you. I'll catch you again tomorrow with another hand in mnemonic in internal medicine. Um, guys, I'd also just like to place on record my uh, appreciation towards one of my mentors in internal medicine here in KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, he is a prolific uh, rheumatologist by the name of Dr. A.B. Miraj. And um, the first time I engaged with him, uh, speaking about the steroid pathway was during one of our uh, uh, Tuesday morning meetings uh, in the Department of Internal Medicine at Prince Mshani Hospital. And uh, Dr. A.B. Miraj, being a rheumatologist, actually recited the steroid pathway, every single substrate and enzyme from memory. So this is a special shout out and a thanks to Dr. Amy Miraj, you are indeed an inspiration uh, to me in my journey in internal medicine and uh, God bless you.